So we're really live. We're, we're live. We're streaming right now to everybody all over. We're streaming at Channel 9. We're streaming at buildwindows.com. And it's my boss. It's Scott Hunter. Yay, Scott Hunter. Thank you. So the joke is, we used to call ourselves the Lesser Scots. We used to be called the, the Lesser Scots, or the collective noun is Scots the Lesser. Um, but we were naming ourselves this year to the Scott.net, or the Scott .net, .net Scots. .net Scots. Scott .net Scots. Yeah, we used to be in meetings, and Guthrie would be there, and then they would return to him, and they'd say, what does Great Scott think? And then they'd say, what do the Lesser Scots think? Which means we got to vote as a group. <laughs> so we got to vote for, as two of us. He got to vote plus the veto. Yeah, two, two of us did not equal a veto over, over, over him. Right, so. but some, there's been some organizational changes. Yeah, that's the big thing. That's why we're the .NET Scots now. Okay. Is, uh, we did a, a merge recently in uh, late January. We took the ASP.NET team, which used to be more in the Azure group, and we moved it into the .NET team. Um, that and seems kind of obvious, though. It does, doesn't it? Don't you think? But we were in the web kind of stack under Guthrie and Azure and doing all that kind of stuff. And then .NET was in what they called DevDiv. Yes. And now, now we're back in DevDiv, and .NET is whole with ASP.NET and .NET together as one entity. So who runs ASP.NET and .NET together as one entity? Me. There you go. <laughs> a, a new Scott emerges. You're like the new great Scott. You've got a promotion. Do you think and as, as we even say on the slides, we have a, I would it's, encourage it's a new hope. You, I would encourage you to start shopping for polo shirts. It's a new hope. It is it. It is, it, it is a new hope. It is a new poet. And be sure to stay around for the entire trilogy. Because there is a trilogy coming. Yes, there is. So let's talk about .NET. Um, we think it's a really exciting time for .NET. I mean, you guys all heard the, the stuff this morning. You know, we announced about a month ago that we were going to acquire Xamarin, and we finished that uh, a week or so ago. And then I'm sure you guys all heard, you all can use Xamarin. Um, as a .NET guy, this is awesome to me, uh, because as a .NET team, this rounded out .NET. Now, any type of app you want to build, if you want to build a mobile app on iOS or Android, if you want to build Windows Phone, Windows UWP, we've got that. If you want to build server, uh, both Windows and cross-platform, we've got that. If you want to build IoT, we've got that. So there should be nothing you cannot build with .NET, with the .NET that we're building today. So You know what's cool about that is that I started out 25 years ago doing VB. And what I could do with VB is I could make you know, forms applications. And then .NET happened, and I learned VB.NET, and I learned C Sharp. I'm trying to learn F Sharp. But as I then went and became a WinForms developer, and then a WebForms developer, and then an MVC developer, and now I realize that I can literally do anything. I can write on tiny little 64K devices, and I can write big data, app, and it's all .NET all the way Every up. way through. Mm -hmm. So awesome time to be .NET. So let's talk about .NET today. Uh, we say the family gets bigger, and that's because there's a clicker. The clicker is not running .NET. It is a Java-based clicker. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about the family of .NET that we have today. We have the .NET framework. And this is uh, the way we like to think of this as a Windows component. This thing comes with Windows. The way you acquire this thing is uh, when you download a new version of Windows or install a new version of Windows, you get a .NET framework built on your machine. And we think it's the best platform for building desktop applications. So if you're a WinForm or a WPF customer out there, that's, this is your platform. And there and, was a time when we weren't sure if .NET was on a machine now. Right. But with 7, 8, 10, you can be sure that there's a version of .NET on that machine. Every new version of Windows will come with a new version of .NET. Um, and so that's .NET framework. Uh, this Java clicker is good. The clicker is good, yeah. Um, so, Xamarin. So Xamarin actually becomes part of the family today. Uh, there was a couple of announcements this morning. I don't think we actually said them in the keynotes, uh, but Mono is now something that Microsoft has. Mm. And we actually put Mono in the .NET Foundation today, mm -hmm. and we changed the license on Mono to be MIT. So there's a better license on Mono. Could you, could you say a little something about the .NET Foundation and where that fits into your organization? We, we have slides later on. We do? Yeah. All right. So, Xamarin is part of our stack, and this is where you can build OS X, iOS, uh, Android applications on .NET. And then we introduced last year .NET Core, and .NET Core is our cross-platform, very small, side-by-side -side version of .NET that we're looking at for the future of server and console-type applications, and we'll have other workloads that will come on this in the future as well. And so this is, a, this is our family of .NET. OK. Um, so how do you get them? Once again, as we said earlier, .NET Framework is a Windows component, so it comes with Windows. And the other two are distributed with your application. And then each of these, ah, 
Do you want me to click? Um, we'll just go to the next slide anyways. So this is, <laughs> this is actually how I look at .NET today and how I think of .NET. And this is actually both good and a problem. It seems uh, a little bit busy. It does seem a little busy. With all due respect, sir. And we are going to unbusy the <laughs> I'm getting, I, getting used to it. I inherited this stuff, man. <laughs> oh, 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 hello. Um, he's, just, he's just joshing. But if you look, I mean, we have three base class libraries. We've got the base class library that ships as part of the .NET framework. .NET Core has a slightly different version of that that shares some code from that. And then Mono's got a base class library that shares some code from that as well. And uh, sharing about 40% that, that Miguel's taken from the, the .NET framework. Um, so that's interesting. Um, we want to fix this. And so this thing is killing me. Here, let me, let me help you with that. OK, if okay. you want to share so code. So went from here. Yeah. Just transition smoothly. No one if you want to share code, today you have to build what we call a PCL. And PC, there's nothing wrong with PCLs. PCLs are awesome. PCLs are? Portable class libraries. This is if you want to write .NET code and share it across .NET Framework, you want to share it across .NET Core or Xamarin, we have this PCL notion. Now, I like that, and I used it a number of times. Where does it, where does it become a problem? Where does it break down? Because I liked it when it first came out. The biggest problem with PCL is when you build a PCL, I'm sure people in the audience have built PCLs, you have this dialog box that comes up, and you have to check the platforms that you want to, run, you want to write your code against. Well, what happens if another platform comes out, which we have had a lot of platforms in the last, last couple of years? Mm -hmm. Each time that happens, you have to go back in that dialog box and check stuff. So you can't just go build a, a library that can be shared across .NET. Um, you have to actually go check the implementations that you want it to run against. And, and your PCL actually has a hard reference to each of those base class libraries. Um, and so there's a couple things here is key APIs are not on all the platforms. I'm sure people have tried to write PCLs and gone, man, I, I can't do all the things I want because some API is not available. Um, Maybe the APIs have different implementations on some platforms. And you, know, you have to master three class libraries to actually write a PCL today. Right, because when I started in .NET, I learned the BCL, right, the base class library, and I understood that. And then I go over to uh, a PCL on some smaller, you know, smaller uh, platform, and I, and I think, oh, I'll just use string.foo. And then it's like, wow, you've got .bar, but .foo isn't here. And then you get confused, and you have to remember all of the, the permutations. So we want to talk today about how we're going to go forward. Click the slide, please. This is the world we envision moving forward. We have a new term that we're going to bring out called the .NET Standard Library. And this is one BCL that crosses all three of these stacks. So you have one BCL that's across .NET Framework, .NET Core, and Xamarin. And this BCL, this, this class library that we share across all three of those vertical platforms, um, will actually not be the super small intersection that we had before. PCL was an intersection so it's, of. It's not the least common denominator. It's, it's the, a reasonable common denominator. It's the most common denominator, the biggest common denominator. Nice. Um, and so this means like if you're writing a UWP application today, you might find that there's no access to FileIO. Well, in the .NET standard library, FileIO will, file, file will be there for all the platforms. And so for you as developers, this is going to make your life a lot easier, because if you want to write code that you share across .NET, .NET Core, and Xamarin, you basically just reference the .NET standard library, one library to rule them all. Um, there'll be new, new things in that library. You see, see down here we say full implementation. So as we add new things to .NET, they'll actually be in, this, in that .NET standard library as uh, NuGet packages. And in some cases, for things like string and stuff, they'll actually still point back to the other verticals where their reference code might actually exist today. I'm going to click. Next slide. And so you see, there's a whole bunch of benefits you get from this. Same APIs on all platforms. You master one library, not a bunch of them. And there's a huge surface area, not a bunch of small surface areas. Let me ask a question. If there was a thing that, w that you want to be in the big surface area, but a, a, a new tiny thing comes out, like I don't know, you know, a watch or a necklace or whatever, and it wants to be a part, but it can do everything except that one API, what happens? We would, we would make that API throw on that platform. So you'd say, not supported. So yes. the API exists. You're not going to get squigglies. You're going to get a runtime exception that basically says that's not something that my, neck, my .NET necklace can right. do. Right. We've even run into this in the case of, of writing cross-platform ASP.NET today, where we have a cross-platform ASP.NET. Our, our default file template in ASP.NET tries to reference Windows auth. Well, what happens when you run yeah. that on? Or the registry. Or, or the registry or something else. Right, what, right. what happens in those scenarios? So let's go to the next slide. All righty. 
So as we think about the .NET moving forward, we have a couple of areas of innovation. One is you're going to see most of our work happen in this .NET standard library. So um, when we add new things to the framework, we're going to add them down there, not up in the .NET framework or .NET core or Xamarin. We're going to put them down here in one place, which means we can move this place faster than those other things can ship. So let me see if I understand. If there's a feature to be added, rather than adding it to ASP.NET and then having WPF people or iOS people have envy over that feature, you add it in the .NET standard library, and, everybody and it lights it. up for everyone. Yes. OK. And then what about all the stuff at the bottom, though? Does everyone get to share that, too? That's the stuff that we share across the entire stack. Okay. As you see, uh, there's a talk later today with Mads and Dustin. They're going to talk about C Sharp 7 mm -hmm. and some of the new F Sharp stuff and VB stuff. The compiler platform will be shared across all three stacks. Languages are shared across all three stacks. Um, and some other infrastructure like jitting and garbage collection and stuff like that will be shared across all the stacks. Mm -hmm. From a tooling perspective, you're going to see our tooling, Visual Studio and Visual Studio Code, both are the things that we'll tool across all of these verticals and the standard library. And then finally, you'll see us actually do work in, the, in the, what I'm calling the app models now. Um, and so what it means is, if we don't ship a .NET framework every year or every six months, mm -hmm. customers should not be worried because we're going to be giving everybody benefits in the .NET standard library mm -hmm. and in the tooling aspects of things. So let me ask you this, then. If I'm going to go and do uh, a hackathon, and I'm going to talk to a whole room full of people that are maybe new and fresh, and we're going to maybe start out with uh, Hello World and some console applications, and we're going to do it at the command line, and we're going to just get our feet wet, yeah. get started in 10 minutes. We start teaching them C Sharp or F Sharp or VB. We teach them the .NET standard library. And then once they have a good grasp of that library and the underlying technologies, then they are enabled to go and pick an app model or app models and by learning that .NET Standard Library, you're well-placed to be a mobile developer, a cloud developer, a tiny device developer, or whatever. Exactly. That knowledge moves across all of those things. If you want to go build a console app that runs on Windows, you would use the .NET Framework. If you want to write a console application that runs on Mac, you'd use okay. .NET Core. So then a WPF or ASP.NET specific uh, functions, libraries, and stuff live in, that, in the app model, not anywhere in the .NET right. Standard Library. Correct. And so that means WPF and Windows Forms, they would rev when Windows revs, because that's when the .NET Framework revs as we move forward. OK. OK, let's go next. I'll let you talk to this stuff. Yeah, so the other thing that's really exciting about this is that this is all going to be developed in the open. If you've been paying attention, you've noticed that not only is it open source, but uh, both the good and the bad happen out in the open, right? Uh, and there's some really interesting things. I think it's so funny when I watch some of the technology journalists talk about you know, announcements and things, but then I hear from some of you all that, well, I saw that commit message three weeks ago, and I saw them talking about it on this GitHub message, if they dug around in the commits, they'd see a lot of really cool stuff. And the other thing that's really significant about this is the number of community contributions that's going on. And I had a, uh, an individual come up to me after a talk I gave today on open source and said, you know, my boss doesn't like that this is open source. He says, you know, suddenly we can't trust this code. We can't trust Microsoft. And, you know, what are we going to do? Because all those community contributions now are going to, you know, destabilize the platform. This is going to be a problem. And in fact, the code that you, and I hope that you do commit code and get involved in open source that you give us goes through the exact same processes, the exact same scrubs, the exact same you know, geopolitical checks, the exact same security, and all the same stuff. Code that you helped us ship is no different than code that was committed by a developer who works for Microsoft. But here's the important part. He said, tell me what I can tell my boss so that they understand that this is real. And I said, this is supported code. This is supported. You call Microsoft support and you have a problem with some of this open source code, doesn't matter that it's open source because you got it with Visual Studio, you shipped it, and it's supported. So this whole library and all of these different app models, uh, even though they have had work in the community uh, in them, in them are, is all fully supported. We're getting some pretty amazing momentum. This is a funny slide, actually, because every time we give a talk, we have to update those numbers. They get bigger every time. Now we're looking at 24,000 forks. Marketing really loves to talk about the forks number. They're like, oh my goodness, we got 24,000 forks. That's amazing. People love us. And I was like, no, they're making copies because they don't trust us uh, <laughs> to, uh, to not just undo it. You know what I mean? Like, we'd be like, oh, gotcha, made you look. Uh, yeah, I love that you're making copies of .NET so that you, you have such trust in us. Uh, I think zero forks would be a real sense of trust. We've had thousands and thousands of contributors. And one of the exciting things, and I talked about this in the keynote, is yeah. that some community contributions aren't just small checks, big, big stuff, ports to entire other platforms, helping us get the .NET 
uh, core CLR running on other devices, but also things like what's going on in Kestrel. Ben Adams and a number of people worked on Kestrel to take it to 1.15 million requests a second. That's the public numbers. Actually, in the labs, we're at 1.6 today. So 1.6? 1.6. So that number is wrong and off by like 40%. I'm not going to update it. It's 40% is what it's okay. off by, but we'll update it. But we, we never to... said that. Don't talk about that. Well, we have to take the PR yeah. first. We should probably tell them before we, I don't know, do a live stream at Build. <laughs> Excellent. Well, actually, I'm not allowed to take these PRs right now because we're trying to ship the product. Oh, that's an interesting point. So this is one of the cool things about open source that you need to think about. Sometimes it may feel very exciting because you got a pull request into the product. Other times you may go like, I've been trying to get this fixed for months. What's going on? Well, he's trying to ship the product, right? This doesn't mean, developed in the open doesn't mean continuously shipped, right? There are still windows and things like that. So that's a very valid point. But some of the things that are really worth pointing out are 40% uh, performance gains that the community made happen. Yes. So this is collaborative, and we are getting better at this every day. And that was the game you showed this morning as well. The game this morning was uh, Age of Ascent. You can go and do their play test at ageofascent.com. And it's done by a company called Illyriad. And Ben Adams and James from Age of Ascent make, make .NET better. They made the 40% happen there. So they did, you. and, and, and there, was, there was a cake. Cool. Oh, yeah, so I had asked you before about the .NET Foundation. There was this reorg. We brought everything together. You are uh, the great Scott now, and, uh, which is hilarious because his name is Carl. And um, <laughs> the .NET Foundation has a number of projects underneath it. Is it just one or two, a couple projects? I think there's a few. Still not impressed. Well, how, anything, how, anything bigger? I think uh, we just put mono in today. OK, all right, I'll give you that. I'll so we you now that. have you know, crossplatform.net. Yep. Um, and we have the Xamarin SDK, very, uh, which very Scott cool. mentioned this morning as well, which means that all the same code mm -hmm. that you're building those iOS and Android apps with, with Xamarin on today, that, that source code is now available for you to go take a look at, change. Could you say something a little briefly about the idea of where that fits in the Microsoft organization and then whether it is its separate thing or whether it is a Microsoft thing? How does that work? The mono with Xamarin stuff? No, the .NET Foundation itself. The .NET Foundation is a, is a thing outside of Microsoft, technically. Mm -hmm. It's a foundation. The, point, the reason foundations exist typically is to help people build open source software. Um, so if you put your software in our foundation, um, we're the ones that prevent, or, or the foundation, I shouldn't say we, because it's the foundation. The foundation. Right provides the legal support and stuff like that to make sure you don't get sued so and stuff like that. If, if you don't mind, I have one minute of, of because people say uh, blah, 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 foundation, blah, 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 legal support. Blah, and I still don't know what a foundation does. Good job. Um, we wanted to get Windows Live Writer and make it open source. And you think, oh, OK, we'll, we'll clone it. We'll figure out how to do that. But we had to go and take a product from inside Microsoft that was written in older stuff of .NET, bring it forward, make it modern, change logos, all the legal stuff. But then it was like code signing. Well, in an open source project, who manages the code signing? What about secrets? Who manages those secrets? What kind of uh, you know, uh, legal trademarks and things need to be dealt with? Is that, should that be owned by an individual who's an open source contributor who just happens to be the loudest one on the project? So what happened here is that Martin Woodward and the folks at the .NET Foundation went and provided a framework within which the framework is the steward of open live writer. So there is now a Windows live writer open source clone that you can go and get. Just go and, uh, and search for Open Live Writer. And doing builds and doing you know, the SSL certificate. All I, was, the I was just going to say all the framework. certificates, all yeah, that stuff. All the secrets. So if one individual doesn't, uh, you know, doesn't stick around on the project, the project doesn't suddenly become in jeopardy. And this is really important. When a project gets mature, you need to start thinking about a legal framework for it. And we are putting together a mature one for .NET uh, Foundation. And we're still looking for more projects. So uh, this was announced this morning as well, which is we have some new members to the .NET Foundation. We have JetBrains, um, who has Project Rider, which is their IDE for building .NET applications. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got Red Hat. Um, we're going to have them come up and talk later today. Um, .NET runs great on Red Hat. And they're our chief partner when it comes to running .NET on Linux. Mm -hmm. um, and we have Unity, obviously, for building games on, on .NET. And so it's great to, to bring all these three companies into the foundation. Right, and we've got like a steering committee to decide on the direction of the .NET Foundation. Okay, let's get back to let's get tech. Into, let's get into some tech and some and demos. And we'll show some demos. Um, so as I said earlier today, you know, .NET Framework is the premier way for building desktop applications. And so you're going to see a bunch of crypto improvements in the .NET that just shipped um, as part of the previews today. Um, mainly in the case around TLS 1.1 1, 1 and 1.2 support, that is super, super important for us to actually stay up with 
uh, the crypto standards as they come out, uh, so you can build your apps against those things. Um, some cool WPF improvements, so if you actually run WPF apps and put them on different monitors, um, they will scale accordingly to the monitor, so you have monitors of different resolution. Mm -hmm. Now your WPF app will actually scale correctly on each of the monitors. Um, and we've got support for soft keyboards. Uh, I'm gonna show a cool demo of XAML edit and continue. Um, this is, to me, like web for XAML, uh, yeah, where, the, the, where you go in, and we'll, we'll show this in a second. We gotta get into that, that's pretty hot. Um, I don't have a demo for this, but I, we try to get a demo for this today, but we have another cool thing is, I'm sure there's lots of folks in the audience that have built uh, WinForm applications or WPF applications, and you might wanna put those things in like the Windows Store. Um, and so with the, the centennial release of Windows, you're going to be able to start putting WinForm and WPF applications in the store, just like you can put UWP applications in the store, um, which I think is pretty cool if you want to put stuff in the store. Well, and then not only that, but they can have, uh, they can do stuff. So I could have a really great, you know, WinForms app or WPF app, you know, maybe I'm just brainstorming like GitHub for Windows or some kind of really amazing WPF app, but I also want a live tile if I can have one. And you want it to take place in search in Windows as well. So if you're searching in Windows, a, a WinForm WPF app in the store, we'll be able to take advantage of the search capabilities of Windows, take advantage of live tiles, mm -hmm. so you get some of the benefits of a UWP application. Right. Without having the sense of I'm gonna rewrite my whole app to get into the store. Which is why we're calling it a bridge. Nice. Um, so, with that, let's jump to the demo real quick. Okay. Can you switch this? Oh, I gotta push the button? Number six. So I've got a health app that I think we showed you last year. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run it. This is a WPF app, I think. WPF we application. Used, we used in a demo once. Is this, this, was probably, this was one that I think that we also did at Connect, and that uh, this was involved in that diabetes thing. It was. Well. We did a whole bunch of health stuff in that, in that event. Mm -hmm. And so because I, 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 I ran this in debug, I've got this toolbar that shows up here. Can you zoom in on that? What's going on With here? a selector, which lets me enable selection. It lets me, I want that to go away. Hit, uh, yeah, hit the Windows button, sir. There we go. Um, there you go. Now, does that come up every time you go into debug? If you're in debug mode, yes. All right, cool. So let's try that. Let's actually hit the selector. All right. And then you can see as I move around the WPF application, all the cells kind of highlight. So are those controls, are those elements in the uh, XAML tree? There are elements in the XAML tree. So let's click one. And now it's, I clicked it. And I'm going to press this other button here, which says go to live visual tree. All right. And so what it did is it found the element that I clicked on in the visual tree here. Here's all the elements on the WPF application. And it highlighted the one that I clicked. And if I click the button here, the source code will come up for this. So I'm now looking at the live XAML for this. Now what's cool, a lot of folks, if you're web developers, you might have actually used the F12 tools in a browser before. Right, right, and the DOM Explorer, and you want to say inspect element, which is, I know what that is, show me where it is in the code. And after you do that, you might go actually modify the HTML or the CSS or something and see a live update happen in the browser. Oh, as but you then you gotta things. go and build the thing and then navigate to that same page and control F5 and so I've let, done a lot of XAML, it's tedious. So let's go in here and change the font size to something small like five. Okay. And I'll switch back to the app. Can you split screen that and do it again? I don't trust you. I don't trust split screen. <laughs> let's try it. Okay, just stick it off somewhere. So font size five. So change this. You're in debug. Ten. Change it to 20, change it to 30. Yeah, demos like that, where it's just like, you know, we got 30 minutes left, goodbye. All right, we'll see you, <laughs> Good night. You know. So th this should make your life a lot better. It's a lot faster just going and changing the elements live on the, on, while you're running the application yeah, versus it, having it, to stop and start and stop and start. And I have to say, as a, as a web developer, it's those little tiny paper cuts that when you don't have that experience in a rich environment like this, that it makes you not want to do it. This makes me want to go back and maybe port, you know, baby smash my XAML-based game and put it in the store. And so in the dev, the, the 15 bits we, we released uh, today, I think, or yesterday. So I have, can I have this now? This is now. So, so if this you isn't the, like super future. This is now. So that's the update two. Let's go back to slides. All right. So the next one, uh, so another thing, there's, there's a, uh, a wave of new tools coming out for people building UWP applications. Uh, we've done a ton of performance work, um, and we've done a lot of work in the libraries that come with this as well. There's a new meta package that comes with this that fixes a lot of the issues. So if you're looking at perf problems trying to build UWP apps, 
Uh, there's an update coming out really, really soon um, in the next couple weeks, I think, uh, that will let you take advantage of this and be able to build UWP applications a lot faster than you can today. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Is that the demo we just did? We just did that demo. Oh. Languages. Let's talk about languages a little bit. So um, I think it's, uh, what, 6 or 6.30 is when Mads and Dustin come on? Right. So we're in New Hope, and then they will complete the trilogy. They'll come after on. this will be ASP.NET, and then again after that we will bring the... Uh, I'm going to mix my metaphors. We'll throw the ring into the Death Star, and uh, <laughs> they will talk about C Sharp, Visual Basic, and F Sharp. So obviously C Sharp is super popular, widely used, loved a lot, um, and we plan to aggressively keep adding new capabilities to it. And so but, I don't know if people have heard of it. But tastefully. But tastefully, yes. Yeah. That's, that's mad saying that. I love, he, no, it's great, though, because it has to feel like C Sharp. Well, the big thing is he doesn't want it to turn into just a pile of symbols. There oh, are like languages that look like just piles of, of character symbols and bangs and greater than, yeah, less than, and all kinds of stuff. And the operator. We don't want to do that. We want to make it, it stay clean. Um, for VB, I'm going to show a couple of cool C Sharp features in a second. When, when VB will make sure that those same features that I show you um, are usable from VB as well. So for, I'm going to show some tuples and some other stuff, and those will actually be usable from VB uh, as well. And F Sharp, um, once again, we're still investing in F Sharp. In fact, I'm going to show and, or announce, I'll make an F-sharp announcement as we do these demos in a oh, second. Oh, okay, cool. So let's, uh, let's jump back and let's show some C-sharp. All right. So this is an app that probably looks like a, a lot of apps that people have seen today, and I'll make sure this is a little bit bigger just in case it matters in the back. So okay. we've got some numbers. We've got an array of numbers. We tally those numbers, and then pretty straightforward right line with an overload there with the implied string dot format. And we got a we got like a little class there that kind of just hangs out to hold on to two ints. So how many people have actually written these stupid little classes because they need to return more than one value from a function? Some please tell me, there's a bunch of this stuff. Would it not be cool? Would it not be cool? Would it sir? not be cool if I could make that go away? Let's just make that go I'm getting, away. I'm feeling it. Hang on a sec. And I take this and I say, this really should just return Sorting, sir. an int called sum mm. and an int called count. Oh, like yeah, that. No. Oh, yeah. Get rid of this. Don't tease me now. Is this how it might work in the future, sir? We might be doing this. What do you think? Is it a good idea? We'll take that feedback to the team. Actually, let's just return S and C. No squigglies. No squigglies. Ship it. <laughs> just to prove it, it actually is real. Yeah, just prove it works. It runs. <laughs> Good. I'm glad because we shipped it just then. Um, <laughs> so other things you like, you look here and you go, look at this right line. Yeah. I can make this right line better as well. First off, I, I can I should, write that in my sleep. I should I've show, been writing that for 15 years. I should show something here as well, which is... If I look at this result, look at that. The IntelliSense shows that I'm getting a tuple back Ooh. with a sum and an int. So, you, oh, I realize you didn't change var t. It just picked it up. It changed its type. But I look at this. This, this doesn't make a lot of sense either. I've, I've got to remember the order, the numbers on this 0, 1 stuff. So what if we just got rid of this? Ooh. And we'll put a dollar sign over here. That's magic? That's the magic. Oh, when you did that, they turned, they turned black. And I'll say, oh, there's IntelliSense for IntelliSense my tuple. IntelliSense inside the string. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Ooh. How about that? So now you don't have to worry about, is it uh, 0, 1, order yeah, by parameters? Yeah, you moved it around or whatever. All that goop, that doesn't make a lot of sense. OK. So what else can you clean up tastefully? Maybe change this one more time and show another, another kind of nice, clean C-sharp feature here. Um, I'm going to take this array of ints, and I'll change it to object. Why? No, just because I might. OK. I'm sure people have got code that takes uh, an array of objects, and they might look inside that code oh, to say, Oh, because you're not just putting ints in there. You could I, have ints and I, ints and then a foo object. I'm just going to modify this sample just because I want to show the feature. All right. And so I'm going to change this code right here to be object. Right. And then what you probably would do here now I get yeah, this errors. Is not, yeah, it's an this object. is not good. So it's, I, I might do something like. Uh, well, if uh, S is object. If V is int. V is object. 
Then run this code. Defensive cast action here. Let's copy this up here. Uh, you got to make an, yeah. My code went away. I think the problem is that you're putting all your curly braces at the end of the line there. <laughs> Shots fired. Um, and then I might do something like var i right. equals v and cast that to an int and then change this to like this. Well, so v, v as int or put the int in front of the v. Yeah, maybe so. Always fun to code in front of Scott. Sorry. So I'm sure people have written code like this. Yep. Um, you got this wasted variable you created here. Yeah. Wouldn't it be cooler if I just said this? So now, when I do my check mm. to see is an int, I can name what I want it to be afterwards. And, and I I'm, comes along and is scoped inside of there automatically. And I'm good to go. <laughs> Application still runs just like so it did So do I need to go and get the new stuff to get that? Can my older apps use that? Is that when you talk about innovation, where does that live in the stack? So this is Roslyn. Okay. So where this, this is coming from Roslyn. The compiler. The compiler. And um, all the features that I'm showing are features that will show up by the time we actually RTM uh, the next version of Visual Studio that we're giving people a preview copy today. Okay. Some of these features work today. Okay. Tuples does not work today. Okay. Um, I, the the uh, string matching will work today, I'm, I'm pretty sure. But thinking about your inverted stack there of, of uh, things where you're innovating, does this mean that I would then be able to take like a web forms app? where I maybe am doing things like this all over the place. It's a web forms app, but, uh, and maybe I wrote it a number of years ago, and I could bring it into the new technology, and I could add all these changes. We actually did that in the last version of Visual Studio. We actually shipped, um, for ASP.NET customers, we shipped a NuGet package that okay. you could actually add to your existing ASP.NET application, and it would bring in the Roslyn compilers, because when ASP.NET was first created, it didn't it did nothing of actual Roslyn. We should, we should like, focus on that for a second. You just said that you NuGet in the Roslyn compiler, you new get in the compiler. Right. So you just swap it out and plug, and then the, the app gets that new ability. Yeah, ASP.NET was written with a hook, so it actually could actually hook the <laughs> compiler that it actually wanted to use to build itself. Ooh. That's how we did things. That's um, pretty fancy. So there's a couple of C-sharp features that I think are pretty cool. Mm -hmm. um, let's jump to a prompt I've got here, and let's see, let's do F-sharp. And so, you know, we've been talking about .NET Core, mm -hmm. and Keep talking. We've been talking about trying to make this a, one of the newer platforms. And if you're an F-Sharp customer, you should feel pretty happy that today I'm going to announce that we have F-Sharp support for .NET Core. Mm -hmm. so, um, <coughs> so I actually have the same application that I just ran in F-Sharp, which for me, I'm a C-Sharp person. I'll show the code in a second. It looks like voodoo. Um, but I'm sure if you're a functional guy, it's, it's that no, awesome. it's that it's that good functional voodoo though. Um, so I can just come over here and do a .NET uh, restore, which will grab my packages from my project JSON, okay. bring them in my application. You're doing the .NET restore because NuGet is part of the ecosystem now. It's inside of that .NET tool there. I'll do a .NET build, okay, and it will compile my application. Now you see, you may have noticed the word DNX there. We're in between builds here but uh, it's still using Yeah, there's some, this, these are some older bits that I'm running here. I've got a variety of bits, and that's actually a, okay. a cool feature we can show in a second as well. Yeah, yeah, another bridge. Okay. So I'm doing a .NET so run. So you did .NET restore, .NET build, now you're gonna run it. And my number should show up at the end, there you go. Um, same list, same count, same sum. Mm -hmm. So C, F Sharp support for .NET Core. Um, and maybe I should actually show And, and REPLs for all. I should show the code here for people as well. If you're a functional guy, this will excite you. That looks more complicated to me, but. Yeah, it depends on what you're doing. And this is the thing, right? It's all .NET, right? Like you might see like the folks at jet.com have a whole lot of F-sharp. They're doing some really amazing, you know, like, I don't know, like they're folding the universe on over in itself, because you can only do that in F-sharp. But, the, but you can call those, and there's interrupt with all the .NET languages, right? So you could have an ASP.NET application that's running C Sharp that talks to libraries that are written in F Sharp. So you can use the language that makes you happy for the thing that you're trying to do. 
Yeah, just like we're trying to make .NET awesome on our, every kind of app mm -hmm. you could build, I mean, every kind of device and stuff like that, we want to support all the programmers too. C-sharp programmers, F-sharp programmers, VB programmers. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Um, let's go back to the command prompt, and this is kind of interesting. Well, check this out, Scott. Okay. I'll run version. So I've got... Uh, right. Version of Windows, and the version of the command line tools, and then the version of... And my version of, of, of uh, the tools is 001598. Okay. What does that I've mean? Got is, another, that your, is that your birthday? I've got another uh, one of these over here. 1898. <laughs> this is a newer version this of... This is my birthday. <laughs> okay. So wait a second. You've just... Uh, you're on a different command line, and it has different versions of the tools? So one of the key tenets of .NET Core is I can have more than one of them on the box. Um, and I can do that without any, doing any weird registry goop or system32 goop or anything like that. Mm -hmm. I'll actually show how these are on my box. Uh, but these are just two .NETs. You can see I'm running side by side. And this is a really important tenant because remember before when he had that list of all the different frameworks and it said .NET delivered with Windows, .NET Core delivered with the app, Mono delivered with the app. The, there is a problem with the full framework in that, you know, uh, he writes an application in .NET 4.5, and then she wants to use .NET 4.6 on the same machine, and 4.5 person's just a little nervous about that because he's afraid that there might be some incompatibility. There probably isn't until there is, and then there's a problem. You don't want to have application A affect application B, and you're saying that it's just not possible. It's not like physically not possible to have that happen. So what's funny is, is this... This version of .NET I have on my machine, mm -hmm. I didn't even run an MS MSI or anything. I went to GitHub, downloaded the source code raw, mm -hmm. and just copied it to a folder. So I've got. Now that's not necessarily the way people would do that. No, I'm not recommending this. Oh, okay. Um, but, you did, but you did that, because that's I, how I, you roll. I did it because I happened to know that the bleeding edge build of .NET that I was using for ah. my C Sharp stuff did not work with F Sharp at the, at the current moment. And oh, so, interesting. So you didn't want to affect your existing development. So you have your own private version of .NET just sitting there, .NET F Sharp. I have a .NET which yep. I'm using for some of the C-sharp demos. Yeah, that Go you're being away. protected from. <laughs> That's happening because it's, uh, you know, it's a private build. Um, okay. And then I've got a .NET F-sharp, which is an older version of .NET Core that's running there as well. Nice. And sl slightly different layout structure. You effectively X-copy deployed. I X-copy deployed two versions of Core on my machine so I could show two demos with different layers of the, of the tool set and mm. not be afraid of breaking something on the box. And architecturally, they cannot affect each other. They cannot affect each other. And we'll talk more. We have a, we have a, a demo later on where we'll actually talk more about that. All right. OK. So let's go back to Visual Studio. And I'll show something else. So this one, this one blew me away. This, you, he showed me this twice, and I'm still not quite sure that I understand what's going so on So first here. off, let's, does anybody remember this? FX you, you cop. Talk to this? Anybody ever use this? FX Framework Cop, yeah. Does anybody want it to come back? Yeah. Well, See, I always thought the compiler, I always tried to explain the compiler is the red squigglies, and FX Cop is the green squigglies. So check this right. out. I've got a NuGet feed on my machine called FX Cop. And inside of it, I have a bunch of Roslyn code analyzers. Once again, Dustin and Mads are going to talk more to the details uh -huh. of this. And these are different than the FX Cop of, of Yor. These, the FX Cop of, of Yor was this tool that was built yeah. that people ran and it analyzed their code right. and spit out some results. I remember results. running it from the command line as part of my Nant builds in the, um, and in, so, in the late 80s. While I show these things, first off, these are pretty cool. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you knew this, Scott, but these are actually sitting up in GitHub today. Okay. Source code's available. So hang on, let's parse this for a second. Remember why Roslyn is significant. We keep saying Roslyn, 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 instead of saying like the C Sharp compiler, because Roslyn is a compiler as a service. Ro in, you know, in, in the old days, right, like last week, you would want to compile some .NET code, you'd put it in a temp file, and you'd shell out to CSC or FSC, and you'd compile the thing, and then you'd get the temp file, and you'd pick it back up, and there was a little dance, right? And that's the dynamic compilation meant that. ASP.NET itself used to take .aspx pages, and f you could look in Task Manager and see CSC, the compiler, jumping up and compiling stuff, and it was a lot of temporary, remember temporary ASP.NET files? You love those? Uh, this is a compiler as a service. It all happens in memory. So that means that analysis and code introspection can happen in memory Live, as, well. as you Live, type. Live, so, as now, you're typing. Now, and it, we, the goal is not to make it speed slow down Visual Studio. So right, this, runs, this runs on a, on a secondary thread in Visual Studio in the background as you're typing, 
Roslyn's running. Isn't it running its own process even? It runs its own process. Okay, so it's even, it's even more isolated. It's not going to slow things down. So I'm going to add these NuGet packages that contain these analyzers to my project. Are you adding all of them or just specific ones that you I, want? I chose two of them. I chose uh, system runtime analyzers and I chose, if you're writing libraries, API design guideline analyzers. Okay, so it's kind of factored that you don't, it's not an all or nothing situation. I don't have to bring them all in. You could go out to, to GitHub if you wanted to. And, and, and wait a second, you NuGetted them in, which means that it's probably uh, project based, which means that you might have one project with four or five and another project with one or two? Correct. Mm. So let's go under my references note here. Right. And I'll stretch Ooh. this out here. Yeah, this is the part where I thought it was cool. Zoom on in on that. And uh, let's zoom in here. Mm -hmm. And if I click this, notice this new analyzers line shows up here. And if I click it, you can see the analyzers that I brought in. And if I click it again, we can actually see all the rules that are in the analyzer. Abstract types should not have constructors. Unacceptable, disable. And these are actually a little better can you do that? Or a lot better, yeah. Actually, let's look at that. So while I'm in one of these, maybe I don't care about this one. So I, was I, can, totally, I was totally making that up. I can right click on here and I can decide, oh, I don't want this one, so I'll just turn it off. Or I can say, <laughs> I don't want it to be an error or a warning, so I can just go set those levels. Mm -hmm. And those are open source, they're NuGet packages. The code for them, not the samples, but the code for them are, is, is on GitHub so that you can write them, so that you all as chief architects of your company, because I assume that's who you all are, you're all the chief architects and you've come here to build, can go and write your own draconian, uh, <laughs> here's how the curly brace goes at the end of the line rules that you can then impose upon the poor schmucks uh, back at your job. So we, even, even we as a team are writing our own analyzers. So for example, the ASP.NET team. Are we really writing our own yeah, analyzers? Yeah, we're looking to write analyzers to solve ASP.NET problems for customers as well. Okay. Now, if you ran FX Cop, it was great because it gave you this pile of errors and you were like, ugh. And Until you, just, you finally then, just then, give up. Then you give up and you yeah, just turn yeah. it off. <laughs> um, and so these are a little better than, than the, the, uh, the old static tool. They're kind of a lot better. So I'll bring this in. That is I, an I, exception. I, this is an exception, and I'm getting a squiggle uh, because it's saying I need to have more constructors. Uh, an exception should have a couple extra constructors, one that takes a string okay. and some other stuff. Now what's cool here, I can click the light bulb and just say. Hang on though, before you do that, he clicked the light bulb and it's showing him what it's going to do before it does it. Again, this is inbox. I know there are lots of, there are other third party products that do similar kinds of things like this. But in this case here, he's got, he's using Roslyn, he's using open source analyzers. You can write these yourself. You'll get the exact same uh, preview box for free. And it's suggesting what's gonna happen and telling him preview changes. And he could say fix all occurrences in the document or the project, or the solution. Boom, no more squiggle. Mm. Um, I've got another one here. Um, this is async. Okay. This is something that I think you and I, neither, neither one of us actually knew of this. I had never heard of this, and I'd be um, interested if someone else has. Um, and this case is, I have some code that's calling web client download file task async, right. um, and I get this squiggle here, and I hover over it, and it says, um, do not directly await a task without calling configure await. Um, Did you this know that? You knew that. So yeah. I'll go with say fix it. Yeah, and then it sticks it at the and end. It's it, fixed, it? and so it added this configure await. I was curious what this actually show what it put at the end there. You didn't do was that. Was about. It adds a thing that says configure await falls at the end. There. Didn't know that. And so. And those should, are the little flaky errors, little weird things that'll cause your application the, to fail, and you won't never the, know These why. are weird things. I actually went and found a uh, blog post by Stephen Tobe mm -hmm. um, that described what this is actually about. And it really came down to the fact that if you're writing async libraries, a library you're going to share maybe across a WinForm app or a WPF app and an ASP.NET application, sometimes calling task await can do bad things, like grab the UI thread uh -huh. in your WinForm app or your WPF app. Okay. And so while it's awaiting, it's actually blocked the UI thread and everything else sticks. And as we move to an environment where we're doing more and more .NET standard library things, where there's more shared code, we're going to want to have FXCOP watching us there. Now, are we calling it FXCOP, or does it get a cooler name? These are just analyzers. Analyzers? It's not um, quite as cool. <laughs> I've got one final one of these, which... Uh, I'm going to call it Scott is watching you. Pretty simple here. And in this case, I'm just doing something where I knew up an array uh, of no values. Um, and that's actually a waste of memory uh, because we actually have in the library a singleton 
that and that's better. That's better. That saves memory. me one byte. You're not garbage collecting. I'm sure that's more than one byte, Scott. Two. Anyway, so that's 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 uh. 64-bit could be four. I Analyzers. <laughs> we should go back to slides for a second. No, I'm just playing. I think that's pretty sweet. What I think is cool about that, though, is that they are in GitHub, and we can write them ourselves, and we can start doing some pretty cool stuff with And that. we'll see teams do them as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not going to show it today. Um, we're we're going to show this. Amanda showed this as well in, in her talk, but I'm going to re repeat it real quick. Okay. Um, this is the search, navigate, debug external code. Um, another cool feature that we have is code style, mm. which a lot of teams want to go define what their code style should be. The, the curly brace thing I've been giving you a hard time yes. about. And so you can go set these styles, and as you paste code in or you bring code in from, from source control or whatever, it will format to the styles for your teams. And we're going to make this where you can set this team-wise, oh. and then all the code looks the right way. So when you say format document, it's the way that the team wants the it. The team wants it. When you bring code in, you paste code in, you do anything, or you type code. On paste? On paste. Ooh, that is going to make my Stack Overflow code look way better. <laughs> uh, we talked about FXCOP as analyzers. And C Sharp REPL is something that I, we shipped in, in November and I wasn't even aware of. People don't know that there are REPLs and what a REPL is. Um, uh, the idea that you can go and interactively mess around. Remember when PowerShell came out? And you ran PowerShell, and you're like, what's this for? It's blue. And then you go 2 plus 2, and you're like, oh, now I get it, right? And you can start doing things like that. You know, it's, it's a REPL, except it speaks, speaks PowerShell. Uh, here, he's sitting in here. This is not the immediate window. This is called the uh, C-sharp interactive window. And there's actually a really amazing video on Channel 9 by Casey Ullenhuth, and she is the uh, PM who works on this. And he's in, are you on the screen, dude? i got to switch the screen. It's not as impressive. It is not as impressive. If uh, you don't push the button. All right. This is not the immediate window. This is the interactive window, OK? So he's in here, and he's trying stuff out. And once you start realizing that you just write some live C-sharp and test stuff out, true story, uh, Steve Lasker and I, who's actually falling asleep right now, I can see him. He just, he just nodded off. We're, he and I were in the true story lobby of the hotel last night at 1 in the morning working on a demo and ended up going into the REPL to test. We wanted to know, you know how random the random class worked. And we solved that problem. And it was like, oh, the REPL. And that saves you that moment where it's like, test your code and hit F5 and you know that, that rapid, rapid, what did Amanda call it, the inner loop? Inner loop is the term we use inside of Microsoft. Right. Inner loop is the, um, if you're a web developer, it's like you change some code, you save, you compile, you launch your browser. That's the inner loop. Death, how many steps do you have to do? by a thousand tiny paper cuts. How many steps do you have to do to do stuff before you actually go completely insane yeah. and lose yourself? You took it, you made it real dark there. <laughs> I was right there with you. Well, we have a new hope theme, so. Well, we do have a dark theme. And we're going, to, we're going to Empire Strikes Back next, so. All right. So what are you doing here? So this is something that Amanda showed, but I'll show again as well. How do I? It's like, oh, I want to convert between XML and is JSON. Is this going to copy paste directly from Stack Overflow into? <laughs> it does not copy paste directly, so. Uh, this is a feature the Bing team is working on, where they, they're actually going out and, and, and indexing code samples and stuff okay. like that that live on the internet and stuff. But is this curated? Like, this is like stuff I can trust? I can't tell you. I, I would never trust the code from the internet. But I would never trust code from NuGet either, would I? You're just saying you'd never trust code ever? I would never trust code. OK. But in this case here, this isn't actually just random code from the internet. This is an example where uh, you've got actual code from JSON.net. It's, it's, it's their documentation. It's their documentation. It went on to how to do something. So this is less about, I have no idea what I'm doing, uh, grab the first option that Google and Bing gave us and paste it into the code and format it attractively. Uh, but this is, I'm using JSON.net. I don't know how to translate XML to JSON. How do I? This is a, not a randomly search and paste, but it is a how do I. Now, answer, this, and, this, and that's from directly from their docs. This is pretty cool. So now this is this is a this is my favorite feature, and yeah. this is, I'm a, I'm over JSON convert, okay. and it's saying like, hey, go, this go is, slow on this because this is this is this is important that people get this. You know how when you have the squiggle and then you hit like you know control comma and it adds using, yeah. right? Okay, we've all seen that. Remember the first time we saw it, we were impressed. No longer impressed. Okay, JSON convert. Find and install latest version from NuGet. Well, oh, no, no. Now this, 
So but you, that's not all. You noticed over here that this Newton Jason soft shows up over here. That's There's great. nothing you can do that will blow me away any more than I am already, Scott Hunter. So, so I'm going to go, I'm just to be very explicit, I'm going to go and do undo. Control Z. And notice when I undid. But, but, can now, you redo? And just to be very explicit so it's not fake, let's go back here and do redo. Also because he doesn't know the hotkey. I know the hotkey. <laughs> Look, it's back. So when That's we amazing. actually go and add these packages from this feature, we're actually putting that into the redo undo call stack. Um, so That's crazy. Isn't that crazy? So as you add these NuGet packages, oops, I made a mistake, <laughs> comes yeah. back out. That's cool. That's pretty cool. Um, coming soon? Coming soon. Uh, the other one, which is kind of cool here, is I'm on this JSON code here. Now, this is, to be clear, the serialized XML node that you got in the NuGet that in we just NuGet brought package. in. the NuGet package. And yeah. I, I and press, we don't have the source for that anyway. I press F12, and it goes out and finds the source code on GitHub. So this is a, this is a, this is a feature that... Hang, uh, hang on. They're so shocked. They don't know how to even process that. Would you... Let's just, if you don't mind, just pretend that didn't happen and do it again. I'm being completely serious. There is no... So hang school. on, you don't have the source code for that, I don't Scott have the Hunter. source code for this. You just brought that in via NuGet. That's just a binary. Just a... <laughs> so let me, let, me explain, let me explain why we're doing this. Um, this is a, an interesting example. What we, what we plan to do is we plan to take the most popular packages on GitHub, and we will index the code from them mm. um, in, our, in our index in, in the database. So if you pull those NuGet packages in, you'll be able to F12 directly in the code on GitHub. Like members of the extended family of yes. .NET popular things. We will do it for all of our stuff in the .NET Foundation. Okay. And even better, we're going to let you as developers do this on your own machine. One of the most common problems that we have today, I go and I see customers. And they've got a solution with 80 projects in the solution. Why is Visual Studio closed? We have slow. We only have 180 projects that, that we're opening on a four gig machine. Microsoft, you suck. Well, why, why do we have 180 projects in there? Or, uh, well, it's because I want to be able to F12 it in my source code. I can't control Shift F5 otherwise. What, what if you could index your source control and your local dev machine, and so you don't have to put all that code into Visual Studio in a solution? and have the capabilities of being, being able to F12 and even be able to maybe refactor across all that code. Um, and that's what, the, that's what this is the beginning of, is us trying to go down that journey, make Visual Studio faster, load less things, um, find your source code anywhere yep. all the time. It's the same thing like when I open lots of tabs and, yeah. Because you want it at your fingertips, and that's why we keep it open. And you're, you're sitting there holding all of this code in memory, and it's just not necessary anymore. And this is crazy because this is source code in, in, in GitHub, and I run the application with a breakpoint. You can mark, wait a second, it's not just like fake source code, it's like the real source code, and you can hit F5 and, and, and break to it? Breakpoint. Don't try to. No, I don't. Here. I just don't believe you. It's a, you know, <laughs> just get, we're gonna find the whole thing was a Camtasia, and he was just going like this. <laughs> so how quickly can we have this? So oh, you want to get back to here? Which one's the deck? Yeah, eight. Um, so with that said, let's move forward on the okay. slides. Um, dot .NET Core, OSS, Crossplat, .NET. Mm -hmm. Uh, .NET standard we talked about in the slides earlier. We're going to skip these demos. Um, well, you just said that. Now which makes CLI, it a thing. High performance, native compilation, bunch of good okay. stuff coming. Uh, next, we're going to talk about ASP.NET, so I'll skip this. Yeah, you know, I'll ASP do that. ASP.NET Core is, is coming. What I want to do next is I want to bring up Todd Ooh, from Red Hat yes. um, to show .NET Core running on Red Hat Linux. Where are you at? Welcome, Todd from Red Hat. Thank you. By the way, check out the cool shirt. So we've got, wait a second, redhatloves.net. This is a real domain? It's a real URL. It is. All right, let's You all can go to this right URL now. today. Um, go ahead and uh, log in on your machine there for me. Sure. So while he's doing that, and I'm I will bring up right here while you're doing that, we won't look at your password. So uh, .net, redhatloves.net. Red Hat has redhatdevelopers.com today. You're hot. That's right. Uh, 
I'll give All right. Your way. Cool. So you just um, to it? go for it. So thanks, guys. Really appreciate it. So uh, Red Hat, I, we got a lot of questions. Why on earth are we here? <laughs> And, uh, but uh, we're here because um, we really believe in .NET, and we have a, this great partnership with Microsoft. It was announced back in November, and this is kind of like the, the next, next stage of that conversation, if you will. And um, you know, we want to bring the power of our capabilities in the enterprise um, to .NET on Linux, just like Microsoft is doing on Windows. Um, it's a fully supported uh, version of .NET when, uh, when it ships. Uh, but we got some early bits to show you now to show that progress is being made. So um, not a super sexy demo, but I think the, the point that it's actually running is, is what we want to look at here. So I uh, got some code here. It's a combination of .NET Core code, got some um, uh, web API code from ASP.NET, and also have uh, some entity framework code. So I've, you know, I've got a model here that I've made um, and, a, and a little bit of a controller to... Uh, uh, interact with it through a web API. So I'm just going to go ahead and compile and, and deploy this code. And although I'm using Visual Studio, I'm, I'm running on Windows, I'm actually deploying out into a container. So those of you that uh, know about container technology, it's a great way to um, uh, solve a lot of problems that enterprises face and individual developers even. And it's going to help you uh, really consolidate um, on a host um, real Degree of high degree of isolation. Scott uh, and I are going to do code. a deep dive on containers right. in the next session coming up. So. Exactly. In, so the, in the second part of the trilogy. So right now, so you're in Visual Studio and you went and deployed to the container, and this is running uh, Red Hat uh, on a virtual machine, running on your machine right now. This is live. So it's in the container. So so this is the uh, just threw up a web page that's just returning some JSON showing that hey this message came back. Um, if I go over to a prompt, th these are these are command prompts, you know. Mm -hmm. Not to be afraid of them, right? Okay. Uh, so and you didn't go in, yeah. Okay. So, so if, I, uh, if I do Docker PS, that's showing me what containers are, are running on, right. on the machine. And as you can see, there's uh, this one out there that has this ID of 2B0A. Okay. Uh, so I can, I can interact with that container. So I did uh, Docker exec, uh, just give it the first couple digits of the ID. Mm -hmm. Then I do say cat. So I'm going to type out the contents of a file. So I'll do that. So the first thing we see is the, this file shows you for that, uh, what, what the uh, Linux box, but it's running. And here you can see it's absolutely running uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, 7.2. Um, and uh, if we go over here uh, to show that some of the MD framework stuff is working, we just made it so that if you just type in some random characters. Um, and this is coming back from, from EF. So it's taking whatever I type in on that URL, mm -hmm. dumping it into a SQLite database running inside the container, and then just returning back the, the top 10 rows out of it. So that's going in there. So if we come over here again, uh, we could do a Docker, uh, yeah, Docker exec. And what I want to do here is actually just open up a command prompt into the container itself. Okay. So now I'm actually, when I'm typing now, I'm actually interactively in the container. So I want to just set an environment variable so things are So happy. you just ran bash, and you're, you're in that container. You can see you're in because you're root at 2B. So you're running top now. So now we're seeing the processes running in the container itself. Right. And um, so there's this one over here called app. So let okay. me uh, just take this window and move it over here, say. And I'm going to just. Control, I'm just going to hit F5 on this thing. And as you can see, yeah, app, the process is going up. It's using CPU. So it, it's real. It's live. It's running. And if I let go, it should eventually calm itself down. And there, it's not running it again. So all real stuff right there. And uh, so it works. <laughs> um, so <laughs> this, this means then that I could add .NET apps, .NET Core apps to my existing Red Hat Enterprise Linux workloads. If I've got existing machines that are running Java or whatever, I can just, if I have a farm of Red Hat machines, I can put them on RHEL and .NET Core is going to run just fine next to those other apps. When it's all shipping. When yes. it's all shipping <laughs> and, and, and supported. It's fully supported, so um, if you've got an issue with it and you have a, a support contract with Red Hat, 
Call Red Hat. Red Hat will help. And let's, the, talk uh, about, let's talk about the URLs. So the the so we got the our developer program. Uh, one of the announcements that we're making around the developer program is that if you go there and sign up, it's free to sign up now. Uh, one of the things we got as feedback is, hey, I want to do some development on Red Hat Enterprise Linux, but it seems like it's expensive, or I got to get subscriptions, all that. So for developers. You can get um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux for free for development. Just join the developer program. If you come down by our booth, we'll even give it to you on a USB stick so you don't have to download it. Um, and actually. And then uh, lastly, you know, go to the, the, this URL, redhatloves.net. We really do. I do. I'm a .NET guy. I've been for a long time. And that, that's all of our landing content around .NET on Linux. So. With that. Very cool. Thank you, Todd. All right. Cool. Thanks, Scott. Uh, so. Just to close, as I said, I w as you started, I think it's an awesome time to be a .NET developer because with .NET, you can build anything. Um, we just showed Linux, containers, Red Hat. You've got some IoT coming up in the next, in the next yep. session. For, I would like to say, I mean, it's not exactly right, but I like to say, you know, from 64K and from tiny devices to 64 gigs or terabytes or petabytes or whatever, whether you're doing big data in Azure, whether you're doing little tiny things in IoT and everything in between, I started in WinForms and now I can write anything. Um, we've got a couple other sessions today as well. Um, we've got, uh, after, after this, we have Introducing ASP.NET Core 1 with Hanselman and myself. Uh, we've got Future of C Sharp later tonight in the same room with Mads and Dustin. The trilogy. Trilogy. Yep. Uh, tomorrow we've got Entity Framework Core with Rowan Miller, building desktop applications with Uni. A uh, bunch of more stuff on the, on the WPF stuff is going to happen there. Uh, Dan Roth's going to talk about MVC, do a deeper dive of MVC as well, um, and deploying core applications as well. So, Very cool. So we will hopefully uh, see you soon. Make sure to share your story and do your challenge points. Give us some feedback. And uh, there's your QR code, and you can be one of the three people that uh, scans QR codes. Thank you Thank very much. Thank you very much. much, and I hope you guys hang around for the next talk with uh, ASP.NET. <laughs>